Hello there guys and welcome to another episode of Genuine Chit Chat. This week I am joined by my self-proclaimed co-host Megan, as well as the guest, Tony Farina. Now if you've been listening to Genuine Chit Chat for a while, you'll know that Tony was on episode 71, where he spoke about his job as an online educator, and so we thought we'd have him back on again, because I want him and Megan to meet, because Megan, my girlfriend, being a modern foreign languages teacher, and Tony being primarily an online educator, I just want to get a talk about sort of the education system both in the UK and the US during the lockdown and also before the lockdown. Aside from education, we do also speak about language a fair amount, because... Megan being a languages teacher and speaking four different languages, that comes up. Uh, We do, the conversation does kind of flit here and there occasionally because it's a really fun, organic conversation. Even though we do talk about lockdown sort of in bits and pieces here and there, it's not a podcast all about the lockdown. It's not a podcast all about coronavirus. It's just three people sort of chatting about things outside of and including the lockdown and having great fun while doing it. So this is truly just more of a fun chat than anything too serious, but obviously there's a lot of interesting information within this, so take it away as you will. And also this is part one of the chat, part two will be out next week, but I'll get more into part two at the end of the chat. Before the chat gets started, there will be a quick promo for the Comics in Motion podcast. They are very good friends of the show, Comics in Motion, my podcast Star Wars Comics in Canon, which comes out on Saturdays. That airs on the Comics in Motion podcast feed. And also Tony Farina does have a podcast called Indie Comics Spotlight, also on the feed of Comics in Motion. And I recently appeared on an episode of that to speak about the comic Second Coming, which is about the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is it's, it's brilliant. So that's basically it from me, guys. As I say, after the promo, it will be the main part one of the chat. Then at the end of part one, I'll come back at the end to talk about some more information, including what's to come next week, future episodes, as well as what I did in the Star Wars Comics and Canon episode recently, and a bit more information so this start isn't too conflated and rambly. So I'm going to end it there, guys. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Hope you enjoy the chat, and I'll talk to you guys at the end. We are Comics in Motion. I'm Dave, the comic nerd. And I'm Chris, the TV and movie geek. You can download our show from your favourite podcast catcher. We review TV shows and movies that are based on comic books. So if you can come along and join in the fun, that'd be super. Welcome to Genuine Chit Chat, where we have honest conversations with interesting people. And I'm your host, Mike Burton. Because obviously you're a professional, if you want to uh, repeat to listeners who may not have listened to you previously, of just how, has it changed at all with the uh, lockdown sort of stuff? Well, it's interesting. So like I'm normally an online instructor. So my job is always, my job hasn't changed too much um, for me personally, because this is what I've always done for the past seven years. I've, I've worked just from home. Um, I've been teaching for 25 years at the college level, but um, the last seven has been exclusively, this is my office, this is how it is. So, uh, but since this has happened, what has changed is um, the students who, my particular university, Siena Heights University, we do a lot of degree completion stuff. So we have um, a lot of folks who are nurses coming to, to go from RN to BSN. So in America, that's a two-year degree. Most nurses, it's just a two-year degree, which is mind-blowing to think you can learn all that stuff in two years. Like the stuff that a registered nurse knows in two years, I don't know how they hold it all. And it's like an amazing ability to retain and do in for, because they're not just retaining information, but it's practical skills. It's just stunning. So then there's a bachelor's of nursing, which my school does online, where it's more um, theory-based stuff. And so we have a lot of those students. We have a lot of firefighters and um, sign language interpreters and EMTs and folks who are coming back who like had degrees that were primarily two-year degrees and now they're getting four-year degrees. So, so what I've seen prison workers who just, they just don't, they just quit attending class. Like they're normal online students. They know they take online because they work overnight. They work weird shifts. And now that this is happening, what you're finding is some of them just are working. I had one guy who emailed me. He worked seven, he worked 21 straight days, 12 to 15 hour days. Jeez. So he just quit attending for a while. And so what I've been is I'm kind of a dick with my late policy and everything. Like I'm like to me, my whole semester is open. Like 
the semester seven weeks long and, and it's open a week before that. So on a week, negative one week, you know when the last paper's due. So I'm, I don't, it's not like I surprise anybody with anything, but I really threw all the due dates out the window and was just have, working, have been working with people. So our on ground part of our university, they've moved everything online. And that's been kind of a scramble because not everybody who teaches an on ground class, not everybody who teaches, um, like art history is an easier class to translate online, of course, because you can just upload the images that you're studying. Um, yeah. You can upload the theory, but like figure drawing, how do you move that online? Course, <laughs> that's such an in-person, the, the instructor is like we are, we're talking in real time. And so to do things like that has been difficult. Um, and there are some teachers who just have never wanted to move online, which is, of course, they're right. There's just like, there's not every student's going to want to be an online student. Not every instructor is, there's a lot of our math faculty who just have been really resistant to it for their own reasons, because they feel math is better learned in real time. Um, so they're trying to adjust to that. So it has been an adjustment for everybody, even for those of us who've been permanently online. That was a really long answer. Sorry. How about <laughs> no, you, Megan? Because you teach, you teach. So how did it go for yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, so it's really weird for me, because obviously, like, I went from teaching, like, all day, so, what, nine till three, like, six lessons a day and really, really busy days, and now I just have a lot of time, because, like, so with my school, they're not doing the virtual classes. At all. So we're not we're not doing the face-to-face ones, so I don't go on, like, Zoom and Zoom my students. So for us, it's just a case of setting work on the, like, platform that we use to set work. Their parents have access to what homework they're doing, and we essentially have to treat it like our normal timetable, So I have to set, like, Monday, I have to set four lessons for four different classes, whereas on a Friday, I might have to set six. But, like, it's just odd because I have no control of getting those students to actually do the work. So, like, I've got my year 10 class. like So with the whole coronavirus, all of the year 11s, which is when they get their qualification for their GCSEs, they're 16. They just don't do their GCSEs this year. It's been cancelled for them, essentially. Well, how's that going to change what happens to them next year? Bro, this is the thing. So with the current year 11s that are meant to be getting their GCSE results this year, they are still getting results. It's just based on prior mock exams. And then what I believe as a teacher, I think they would get. And I have to set them a new prediction based on like how hard they've been working in classes, et cetera, et cetera. But like I've got my current year 10s. So next year they'll be doing their GCSEs. And like 75% of the class aren't doing the work. (laughs) Yeah. Like... The work that I'm saying, like the majority of the class aren't doing the work. And I'm just like, okay, brilliant. So year 11 is going to be really, really hard for you. (laughs) And also with with Spanish in my school, this cohort of students only started doing Spanish last year. And you're teaching them that at that level and they're just starting? Yeah. So, yeah. So normally they would start when they're like 11 years old learning Spanish. Uh, in my school, they had a different policy and we've now started teaching at age 11. But so the current, the students that will be doing the exam next year, they started doing Spanish when they were 13. So they're actually having to fit that GCSE in three years, whereas everyone else in the country gets five. But obviously because of the coronavirus, they're missing out on like basically half a year. (sighs) Holy shit. And most of them aren't even doing the work, but they still will have to do the exam next year. Yeah, see, and that's the thing for me. My The way that I teach online, it's always asynchronous because I literally have students all around the world. So I'll meet with them one-on-one. I'll Zoom with the student or I'll call the student. But everything, my classroom's always been flipped where I record all my lectures and get all my notes up. But they know that going in. You know, my online yeah. students know they're coming in and they know it's expected of them. And if they don't do it, they're going to fail. Where this is such a unique situation. What would you guys do, Mike? Like, if you were the if you were her students, would you have been doing the work? Like, it's hard for me to to like wrap my mind around it as a stu- like as somebody who's always been a school nerd who knew when I was twelve I was going to be a teacher. So it yeah. blows my mind to think all this homework is out there, all this work to be done, and people aren't doing it. But I also I'm kind the of, same as you. <laughs> I kind of see it though from other the other perspective of a student is like, well, you're not making me do these things. There's no stakes for me to do it. And like you're saying, you're at 15 or 16, you can't think of the ramifications of what this will mean for you in the fall when you come in and you're totally screwed. So I don't know. I I, I don't know. Mike, you said before you were a really good student, so you probably would have 
been doing it too. Well, the thing is, I was a good student. I was a good student, but I was a pain in the ass. That's the problem. <laughs> is that I was. I was that a, hasn't changed. You're still a pain in the ass. Yeah. I, I, I was a smart kid, but I knew I was a smart kid. And my dad was a very intelligent individual. So I had a quite wide vocabulary for someone of that age. And he would always tell me about history and he'd read a lot and all these sort of things. And I was at a slightly higher level to most of my peers in certain aspects. Socially, no. Socially, I was a bit behind, but everything else was a bit uh, ahead. Um, most things were not really academic, not like arts and things like that. But the thing is, is that what happened was instead of being top of the class all the time, because I was lazy with it, because I was so, I was like, well, I'm smart. I could just pick it up without really having to try as hard. With math, with maths, I'd get like an A and with English and stuff, I'd get like B's and science, I'd get like B's. I'd be like between A and B primarily, but a few C's and things like French. I just didn't care at all. I was just, I literally did French. I, I did French in an after school club from, I think in your five and six every Monday for a while in, in that. And then also I went into year seven and it was, in year seven, it was French. And then year eight, they made us do German. Yeah, and a then lot year of nine, schools, they went made us do French again. Do that. It was three really spanner in the works for everyone else. And I still retained a bit of French. They did French as GCSE, so I did it when I was 15, 16. And I came out of that and I could still, I'm I'm all right at, at reading it. When it comes to reading French, I am I can get about 20, 30% of it. Like, the, I aren't excluding the words that are just really obvious. What are the words you call Cognates. Cognates that are the same or look very similar to. Two words that look or sound similar in two, or well, in one or more different languages. Yeah, like fantastic, fantastique, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm all right. I can get like really basic stuff like that, but I really wish I'd apply myself more because I've got a C, so I've got a GCSE C in French, but I do not talk about that in the job interview. No. And you, you speak French, right? You teach French too? Megan? Yeah, French is my weaker one out of the two, so I teach Spanish and French. And Spanish is definitely my forte. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you should just start speaking well. to him yeah. in French, though, and then and he'll have right. to. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that sometimes. Sometimes if Mike's annoying me, I'll just get frustrated and I'll just start speaking in a different language. And yeah. then he'll tell me to stop, so then I'll just switch to a different language. Because <laughs> I, I speak four in total, so like I just switch for them. <laughs> yeah, I've been saying that I want her to speak to more Italian, because when I went over there and met her Italian family uh, in October... Your dad can speak English. Yeah, my dad and, speaks fluent English. But his partner, Marilena, and the your nonna. Well, I mean, it, it's pretty. In- it's the young people in my family can speak a bit of English. The old people in my family can't. <laughs> Not even at all. They just don't. Yeah, and I, funny, it was quite odd because my parents, my, my dad had his own company uh, when I was younger, and my mom was like a manager in some place. So we had money when I was younger. Um, and I, I say this because we they had a house in Italy, my parents. Uh, it was in the south of Italy, the proper south, where like the heel of the sort of foot is. And it was, it was nice, but no one there spoke any English of any kind. So I used to go there for several years down the south of Italy um, quite a bit. So I picked up little bits and pieces. Like, I think when I was the, the pronunciation that some of the people said I picked up the pronunciation all right but the problem is I don't know any of the words yeah. and there's certain bits and pieces whereas like, I have a really weird accent <laughs> whereas I've got because I know a little bit of French as well then it's like the French-ish mix with the and I, they're similar-ish languages it's just kind of like a yeah I mean grammar wise French and Italian are basically the same yeah so I want you to uh, I've been saying we want to um, get to speak more and I'm going to listen to podcasts when I go to work like occasionally of Italian It's just stuff. it just feels weird because like I've tried to explain this to Mike before and he doesn't really get it. And a lot of people don't get it unless they've had this situation. But But my head of department at work understood it. So my head of department is French and she established her relationship with her partner who is English in English. So she finds it really weird to speak to him in French, even though it's her native language. And it's the same for me. Like, for example, so I've got obviously my mum and my dad, uh, but my parents are divorced. So my mum is English and my dad is Italian. But like... If we were ever in a situation where we were all together, I'll speak to my dad in Italian. But if I want to speak to my mum, I'll switch into English. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, won't, I won't speak to my mum in, in Italian. It's the same with my brother. I don't speak to him in Italian because my relationship with that person is in English. So when Mike was like, I want you to speak to Italian. I want you to speak to me in Italian. I was just like, mm-hmm, I don't really want to do that because that's weird. Like, <laughs> it's, like when you, it's like, no, I speak to you in English. <laughs> I don't so speak to you in Italian. When your dad, when I was over there, obviously her dad was speaking <laughs> quite a lot in English because he, he can speak English. So he was speaking to me quite a lot. And also because Megan was there and to be polite so I'd understand, he's speaking to you in English as well. And you said after that on the first really day, weird. you were like, 
my dad has never spoken English to me at all because the brother, her brother, and her mum are both fluent in Italian, and also her brother's partner. She's oh, also she speaks Italian. She as speaks well. not quite as good as the guy, rest of them. But so I'm the only one left. I was like, oh, I need, I need yeah. to pick up the slack, and I've been waiting. I was like. It's gonna be perfect. We're gonna we go on an Italian trip later this year, which is not happening now. Yeah. Um, but it was like gonna be like listen to podcasts, get into it. It was gonna be just after my birthday. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna, and it's like okay, lockdown. Yeah, now nobody's going. Well, it's funny. My dad. So my dad um, was Italian, and uh, his his parents wouldn't speak to him. Like he was he was for uh, technically he's second generation. Like both of my grandparents were born in America. Like half of their family was born in Sicily and the other half was born, mm. you know, in America. So they grew up speaking just Italian and then learned English. So they, both my grandparents spoke fluent Italian and wouldn't, he didn't teach it to my dad or to my aunt because they could then talk about them <laughs> in the room. Yeah. So it oh, sucks wow. though, because I could have, you know, it would have just been easy. Like for you, when you just grow up and people are speaking different languages to you, your brain, you just figure it out. Um, yeah. Is that frustrating for you as an instructor to, because you're so, because you're obviously a polyglot, but also you just being raised speaking both languages as you're, as you're coming up, you didn't even really remember learning the two when, when students struggle, like, how did you learn to teach them being raised in two languages? Is that like, sometimes I mean, you just want to shake them and be like, why don't you get this? Yeah. It's, it's the, the thing for me is that is when, when, when we get onto grammar, because oh, I'll use Spanish as my example because it's my like main one. So like obviously with grammar, when in English we use personal pronouns, so we say you, I, he, she, yeah. it, they, etc., and that's how you know that somebody is doing an action. So I dance. We know that I'm doing it because I said I. Like yeah. <laughs> Whereas in Spanish, you take off the ending of a word and then you replace it with a new ending to say who's doing the action and in what state. So whether it's the present, the past, the future, etc. Um, so it's called the infinitive, which is the full state of the verb when no one's attached to it. So yeah, in Spanish, so for example, the the verb for to speak is hablar. So you would take away the ar, and if I wanted to say I speak, I would put on a note in the end because that that's that's just the way it is. <laughs> and the thing that's really frustrating is kids are like, I don't get it. Why is it so difficult? Why do they do it so weirdly? And I'm like, guys, we're literally one of the only countries in Europe that doesn't do it this way <laughs> we are the weird ones they're like oh but ours is so much easier and i'm like it's really not like once you get the pattern and you learn the pattern apart from however many irregular verbs there are like you get it and they're like oh but they've got so many irregular verbs and i'm like so do we like we have loads of irregular verbs we have way too many yeah but like yeah. this the spelling of o-u-g-h it can be rough it can be cough it can be through like why are there <laughs> thorough? Yeah. Why are there so many variations for like four letters? Oh, the best one. My my, my favorite linguistical thing of proving that the English language makes no sense is, okay, war, okay, standard war, but D at the end, ward, okay, change uh, the A to an O, word, okay, yeah. fair enough. You've had S in front of that. That's not sword. <laughs> that's sword. sword. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, well, wait, that doesn't make sense. And it's same as rough. It's like, okay, rough, right, okay, but T-H-O in front of it, okay, thorough. No, it's thorough. Sorry? <laughs> Where did that come from? Okay. And it's just it's just all that sort of thing. Just There's loads of them. There's a, I remember there was a – I always forget buying it because I remember how cool it was – where it was loads of prefixes and suffixes and middle bit words, and you could flip them and things. And what it did is you, you, you went through them, and it showed you how it's pronounced at the bottom. And it was like showing, it was all specifically made. So it was all the weird words that all, so you go from war to ward to word and all that sort of thing as well. And I just remember thinking it was quite clever. I like that sort of word play. I like using strange words for things. Yeah. It's my fun. I'm convinced. Um, and this is why I think 1984 is like the most important book ever written in English. Cause I think it addresses this in that book. Um, like so specifically, but um, I'm convinced that English, the reason English is difficult is that um, at the time, you know, it was it was the way to, to keep the classes and the genders apart. So if you're a rich white guy, we're gonna we're gonna write and we're gonna speak and we're gonna do these things. And as as the language kind of made it out to the masses after the Gutenberg Bible and everything, I think what happened was, in order to prove who's educated and who's not educated, you make the language more difficult. And so it mm. takes learning. It takes it's if you just pick it up and just go with phonetic spelling, and then you write phonetically, people will recognize that you don't know what you're doing. You seem uneducated, even though 
you know, um, you're, you're, I'm hearing you and I'm hearing you say election. So I would spell it E-L-E-X, S-H-U-N, election. Hmm. But of course, that's not how you spell that word. And so by me writing it the way that it sounds, I'm proving to you that I'm uneducated. And it was a way to kind of recognize the classes. That's my theory yeah. is that is that the English language was made difficult on purpose to keep keep it out of the hands of of the masses. And you know, and, and you mean in 1984, of course, that's addressed specifically, you know, as they dumb down the language with new speak, but then you know, secretly over here they're speaking this more complex language, and then the proles have a whole different language um, that is old and and kind of out of date. And so it's a way to know. So that's why I think English is the way it is in every other language, not every other language, but specifically with English, it was designed with keeping the castes in mind and trying to keep like mm. white dudes in power. I, I mean, yeah. I, I know there's books on it, but that it just makes perfect sense when you look at it. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, it, it came from obviously the culmination of all the different languages from all the people you invaded by and merged with and all that sort of thing, you know, and that kind of put the foundations for that in of having this almost boiling pot of random things that all kind of connect together like random sayings and proverbs and things mixed with different ways of saying the same thing and obviously the north and the south of england geographically speaking across the world doesn't seem very large compared to america and things like that you know in a lot of those places but the the funny thing is i compare england to america in a lot of ways is obviously i know it's more densely populated um, but the north of england and the south of england is like the opposite way around of the standard stereotypes of america with north and south because it's generally the south to be the stereotypical or sort of offensive way the south of the hicks the right-leaning gun owners that you know that sort of thing obviously that's not always the case whereas the 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 progressives were more sort of further up a bit more and things like that the progressives weren't as far down with some exceptions whereas in england it's the opposite down south is the more left-leaning politically correct air quotes that sort of stuff the northern are the more stereotypically negatively seen as less educated the sort of laborers that sort of thing and it's quite interesting that the language itself even going up by we can drive like two three hours north and then the, there's so many different di- uh not dialects there are a lot of accents he has accents and just in, random yeah. sayings and my stepdad is he's from up north and he just i mean sometimes yeah i mean sometimes with Anne, which is my stepdad i do if he's if i'm not paying attention sometimes i struggle to hear what he's saying because he's got a northern accent it's quite strong yeah so in england you've got almost the same amount of different accents as you do as the states in america but obviously they're so much more spread out but it's just a really weird thing language and it's it's from all the boiling pot of things yeah well and it's funny because i live in florida which it does there's not really a floridian accent there's um a lot of fl- hashtag florida man bullshit which i shared with you <laughs> and so anybody if you stuff. don't know this if you want to have fun go to any search engine, Google in particular, and type in your birthday and Florida man. And what you will see are horrible, dumb, assery stories about a man, (laughs) any random man. Like Florida man is is listed. That's what it is. If it's a woman from Florida who does something stupid, it'll be like, keep coral resident. But if it's it's a man, it'll be Florida man does. And it's almost (laughs) become a, a running, it is a running joke. Uh, but it's it's a fun thing to do. But in Florida, there's almost no accent because so many people from Florida are from around. Uh, mm. Florida is, is uh, there's very few people that I know here who are from here. Um, mm. Most people who are from here get the hell out. Um, <laughs> and th- then the rest of us move in. And it's probably a, a, t- a two-way thing. But yeah, and once you, once you get to Georgia, like northern Florida, the panhandle, and then you get to Georgia. And then obviously there's this deep south accent. But even in even in the South, like South Carolina and Georgia, which are right next to each other, they sound there. And then Alabama, all three accents are quite different. And if you, again, were to felt, spell phonetically what people are saying, it mm. wouldn't be at all the way that it's written. Um, and of course, you know, when you standardize language, you you create a, an environment to separate people. And sometimes you can use that for your own advantage. I mean, there's a reason, um, you know, Johnny Depp's from Kentucky. There's a reason he doesn't sound like he's from Kentucky, right? You know, he specifically lost that accent. Ashley Judd is another one. You know, her mom and sister are big time country singers and they talk like they're from Kentucky. And Ashley Judd, you know, the actress, she wiped that accent away completely mm. because she wanted to be taken seriously. As Joe Rogan did the same. What's that? He did the same with it. Joe Rogan did the same with his Brooklyn accent. Oh, right. He heard, right, himself, yeah. he heard himself on TV very early on in his career. And he was like, he was like oh, I hate that. I hate the way I sound. So he, <laughs> he actually, made, and you can see in the interviews of him, from that point and little it's only quite early on but you can actually hear his when he was on news radio fade. yeah he sounds totally yeah. different now than he did when he was on news radio 
Exactly. So it's that yeah. sort of thing. But I was going to say, speaking on the language thing, um, it's interesting. I heard it's uh, something like this somewhere else, but specifically about uh, Italian to Bergamasca, the dialect that specifically oh, yeah. from where you're... I mean, so... It's quite an interesting thing. I didn't realise. I don't know how many areas have it, but like, so in Italy, obviously they speak Italian. Um, my dad is from an area that he's, well, he's from a place called Cirne and the biggest like main city is called Bergamo. Um, There's never Verona or Cape Verde, if anyone It's is, like basically. an north. hour away from Up the Verona, parts, but it's mountains. like right in the north of Italy. Um, it's, yeah, it's near Milan. But um, yeah, so there's in Bergamo, it's got like, I think I don't know if it's just because it's a historical thing or a cultural thing or something that's just gone through the ages, but they have their own specific language called Bergamasco. So they all speak Italian, but then it's mainly the older people. The older people speak Bergamasco as well. <laughs> so like... Some of my family will start speaking in Bergamasco, and I'm like, nah, you've lost me now. I don't know. Like, it's literally a different language. I don't understand anything they're saying. <laughs> they really? say certain phrases. Yeah. They say certain phrases come, like, your. Isn't it certain things that your family say? And if you say it outside of the region, it doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, you, if you said one of those phrases to somebody who's from Milan, they would have no idea what you're saying. But it's also, I know that they have it in the north of Italy. Well, even further north of Italy, like, right in the mountains, like, on the border of where Austria is. I have family that live up there as well. And that's in Razia, which is the biggest city near there. It's called Udine. But they have their own language as well, which is called Reziana. And like, again, if they start speaking Reziana, I'm like, no, I'm, I have no idea whatsoever what the hell you are saying. Like, even my dad doesn't speak that. He used to be able to, but it's, yeah. It's, it's like Spanish as well. You've got in, in the South America, as you said, it's got, you've got the, I've heard other people like Joey Diaz, one of Joe Rogan's friends, he speaks Spanish and he speaks about it. And he's like, if you go like Chilean Spanish is different to Cuban Spanish. And then that is different from Spain Spanish. Well, yeah, and that's different course. from Mexican Spanish. But it's even different between how they teach it in the States and how they teach it here. Like, mm, good point. so my friend Mary, who is American, she's from North Carolina, and we we're actually supposed to be seeing her this month, but sadly, coronavirus. Um, <laughs> she was but, coming to you or you were coming here? Yeah, she was coming here. You're going to Scotland. Aww. But so I met her in Spain because um, she was doing a semester abroad and I was doing the same thing. Um, so we met there. But like when we would speak in Spanish... She'd be like, I don't know what word that is. I don't know what you're saying. And then I would be the same way because she would say different things to me because she'd been taught like Latin American Spanish, whereas I'd been taught Castilian Spanish, like traditional Spanish Spanish. So yeah. <laughs> there'd be different words that we would say and we'd just be like, oh, okay then. Well, how'd that go for you in Mexico then? Oh, uh, Mexico was fine. I knew that there are a couple of words I shouldn't say in Mexico. So the word coger means to like to take or to catch. Um, in Spanish. So if you were say, I'm going to catch a bus, it'd be voy a coger un, uh, un autobus. So you'd go get the go get the bus. But if you say coger in Mexico, it means to fuck. Oh shit! <laughs> so <laughs> you would be so saying, I'm going to go fuck, fuck that coach, bus. that fuck that bus. <laughs> So okay. and there's the, obviously I knew not to say that word, but <laughs> the Anos, uh, thing as well that you say is oh anecdote. yeah, but I love that anecdote. One right? of the main so yeah, this is a completely different thing that Mike's talking about. So when I'm teaching Spanish, specifically when I'm teaching like the younger ones, see so like year eleven year olds when they're first learning how to say like my name is Megan, I am twelve years old. <laughs> like, um, so the word años in Spanish means years. And it's spelled A N with the accent above it, O S. So kids are like, why? Why do we have to have accents? Like, they're just, they're not important. I'm like, guys, no, they are. They yeah. are really important. <laughs> like, you need to have them. They're no, they're necessary. And then I always use this example depending on the class and how mature they are, because in Spanish they don't say I am 11 years old. They say I have 11 years. That's the way that they say it. But the word años with the accent means years. Anos without the accent means anus <laughs> so if they're saying i have 12 years but they're yeah. not saying it with the accent they're saying i have 12 anuses <laughs> and then like i tell them and they're like what and i'm like yeah guys accents are important like you need to say them. <laughs> yeah that'll definitely that'll definitely get their attention well so what do you so i don't know how it works there so like for me because i teach in, i teach college i i made the choice when i was really in high school I'd always knew I was going to be an English teacher. Like since I was 12, I was going to be a teacher. And then I just assumed I would teach high school. And then when I got into high school, so as a junior, so 16, whatever that is for you guys, because um, our system's totally different, obviously. But yeah. um, so I was on our school board as the student representative on our school board. And I learned 
holy shit, the school board really dictates a lot of stuff to these professionals. Like my school board at the time was like a guy who owns a butcher shop and a guy who owns a shoe store and, you know, like community members real, but what the fuck do they know? It's not like the history teacher is going to go into the shoe store and be like, listen, you need to carry more loafers. You're not going to do that. That's not your job. But these people were saying to the history teacher, you shouldn't use this book that, that the history teacher wanted. And it just, so I was like, okay, well, I don't want any part of this. So I knew then I would, I was going to try to teach college before I even got to college. That was going to be my focus. And so because of that, while I have a degree in education, I'm not certified to teach high school. Like I know all this stuff, uh, but I didn't go through the certification, which was good because if I had done that, it would have been a lot easier to just be like, because I was a part-time college professor for like 17 years as an adjunct. That's kind of the way it's done here. You just beat around. You take whatever job you can get, like you yeah. teach English. Like there'd be days where I'd wake up, drive half an hour, teach a class, as soon as that class was over, drive an hour in the opposite direction, teach another class, and then drive back to where I'm from half an hour in the middle and teach a third oh class, God. like all within a day. And that was just kind that of, the game. it's exhausting, but that's the game here, you know? And obviously it would have been way easier to be like, okay, go get your certification. And there's 20 high school openings, but then you can't say fuck in class ever. <laughs> um, and you have to ask the guy who owns the shoe store if it's okay to teach to kill a mockingbird or whatever. So, so that was my process. Um, and that was, you know, I always knew what was yours. I'm just curious. What was your reason? Cause you're a language teacher. <laughs> why, why do I thought, I thought you taught music too. I don't know why I thought that. She's very musical. I, I am musically inclined, I guess, but I don't know. I don't okay, teach you music. Don't teach you play, you play, you're playing the ukulele. The I, I mean, play, play like loosely played the of ukulele. Of so you, like a steel <laughs> drum band. There's mine right there. A lot of stuff. Oh yeah. Cute. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm more of like a jack of all trades, master of none when it comes to music. But yeah, okay, so how did I get into teaching? I essentially got bullied into it. <laughs> <laughs> so like when when kids ask me this, I'm I'm honest and I say the story to them as well. And I'm like, yeah, I got bullied into it. So I, okay, so I graduated from uni in 2016 and um, I was originally meant to be moving to France to work in a university um as the like the languages speaker specialist of english to help students with their english get better um and it was for a year and then brexit happened so i didn't get it <laughs> oh. so i had it they'd confirmed it and then brexit happened and then like two days later they were like oh sorry the position's not open anymore like we're really really sorry so i was like oh okay i don't have a job for after uni now that's great <laughs> Jesus Christ. um so then my friend was like, oh, you should just apply to be a teaching assistant at a school. And um, the secondary school that I actually went to had openings. So I applied and because I went to school there and I was like a good student, I basically <laughs> had the girl. job without even going for an interview. But I did the interview and I got the job. So I worked at my old secondary school in the English department um, as a teaching assistant. And then I was up in the staff room and I was meant to be doing work and I just wasn't. And then I got called into the head teacher's office and bearing in mind, this is my old head teacher as well. Like, <laughs> so I was, I was in the staff room, not doing work. So I got called into her teacher's office. I was like, oh shit, I'm in trouble. Like, what the hell? I was like, no, I got called into there. And then there was my old head teacher, my old French teacher and my old English teacher and they were all like, we want you to be a teacher. We think you should apply to do the program. There'll be a job here next year for you to do your training. Like, have a think about it. You can do it if you want to. There's quite a nice bursary for, for languages teachers. And I was like, okay. Uh, so I just had a look into it. And then I figured that, because my original plan was to get my teaching qualification, do my NQT year, which is your newly qualified teachers year, which I did last year. And then I wanted to move to South America for a year and teach English. Um, and then coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and then but Mike like, happened. And then Mike happened and well, my I... dream was ruined. <laughs> <laughs> I think I met you just after you yeah, so the first school. Yeah, so I... When I met years. Mike, it was... It took a couple of weeks. It was literally like two weeks after I started at my new school. So it was the beginning of my NQT year. So in theory, if this plan had worked out, I would have been going to South America now. So probably in hindsight, with coronavirus... Mike probably saved your idea. life. Good job, Mike man. saved my life. That's how I did it. That's <laughs> wow. Like, that's forward it's amazing. For so many years. I knew <laughs> yeah. about it all. Um, 
But yeah, so then I did the teaching qualification because I was like, if I don't like it, I can always leave, do something else. And then if I want to go back to teaching, I can. I have that option. Um, So I did the most difficult year of my life, which was teacher training. (laughs) And then managed to do my newly qualified teacher's year and now here I am and I actually really love it so it nice. <laughs> kind of worked out that I got bullied into it yeah but being, having all those languages I mean that's that opens I mean if you don't want to do it like you said there's a million things to do yeah it it's, it's cool because I find myself in interesting situations like so actually just after I met Mike so Mike and I met and then three weeks later I went to America for a month and traveled by myself we, we met 4th of July funnily enough oh yeah, nice we just, we just, <laughs> here means nothing Over right, here but, like, yeah. let's not talk about that yeah right. so we met on the 4th of July and then I flew out to America for a month so I, I'd known Mike like all of two and a half weeks by the time that I flew to the States and the first day that I got to America was I landed in New York so my flight left at 6 30 in the morning UK time and I landed at 8.30 in the morning, New York time. So I, I was knackered. Like, sure. I was really, really tired. So I got there and got to my hostel early and couldn't check in my bag. So I wasn't allowed in. I couldn't sleep. Um, so I was like, well, I'll just go for a walk around Central Park. Because I was like, that'll be nice. Um, but I met this girl and she said something in Spanish. And I just automatically like responded in Spanish and replied. Um, and she was like, oh, hi. And then she was like, you speak Spanish. And then we ended up talking for like the entire day. Like we went to Central Park together. I I literally just got into New York, spoke to one girl in Spanish and spent the entire day with her because she was staying at my house. She speak English? Uh, She spoke very, very little English. So we spoke in Spanish. I think she was from Chile. It's like when we were in Mexico, like you talk, people talk to you in English and then you would be like, I, I, you'd be really tired. And you're like, I can't be able to speak in Spanish. And then yeah, sometimes there's that girl, there's that, there's that photographer girl. Oh yeah. <laughs> we really um cool. So when we went to Mexico... <laughs> Because it was a nice hotel. They had like photographers that went round and took pictures of you. This girl obviously saw that we were a couple. So she ended up making us do this most ridiculous photo shoot whilst we were in the swimming pool. And I was just like, <laughs> like I hate being the center of attention. So I was just like, this is the worst, but this is so funny. <laughs> um, but she was speaking to us in English. And then she was like, do you speak Spanish like at all? And then I said, yeah. And then I started speaking in Spanish to her. And she was like, what the hell are you doing? Why are you speaking to me in English when you speak in Spanish? Like, she was like, you need to speak to me in Spanish. I'm already doing a lot of work. You're on holiday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just there like I don't know Mike was yeah, just there know. like I'm in the pool <laughs> yeah. I know a very 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 small amount of French an even smaller amount of German and next to zero Spanish tiniest bit of of uh, Italian as well it's just like nothing much at all so yeah. Spanish is actually the one I know the least which is actually Megan's strongest and Megan's weakest is probably French isn't it <laughs> It's written, written Italian. Realistically, French is probably a bit higher than Italian altogether because I've got a degree in French. It's just that my confidence with French is probably a lot lower than Italian. But you grew up speaking Italian, so you just feel more... I did grow up speaking yeah. Italian. So, yeah, I'm not fluent in Italian anymore because I was born there and moved away when I was four. And because I'm very stubborn as a person, when I moved to England, I didn't want to speak Italian. So I basically just spoke in English and refused to speak in Italian and essentially lost it all. And then when I learned French and Spanish, I had to kind of relearn it as I went along, which is why I've got a really weird accent, according to my family. Because you sort of say Spanish words in the in the middle as well, don't you, when you speak uh, Italian again? Yeah, less so now. When I moved to Spain, I would speak to my dad on the phone in Italian, and sometimes he'd have to stop me and be like, Megan, I don't know what you're saying. You're not speaking in Italian anymore. You're speaking in Spanish. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Romance languages. It's fine. <laughs> They all derive from that, and they're the right. same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for us, we, we're, where I grew up, um, languages weren't required, um, that, which is just disheartening. And they still aren't. Like, you, you, when you get into high school, so for us, it depends on the person. I was younger because uh, my birthday's in the summer, but so I was 14. I graduated high school at 17. But so for most people, it's like, um, you know, you get into high school 15 through 18 in that kind of range. And uh, you you take usually one or two years if you want to. I took three years of German and was pretty fluent and then went to college and had no one to speak to. And so, I mean, every once in a while I'm watching a movie. Like, I think I was watching uh, Winter Soldier. And I was like, hey, I know everything that they're saying. Like, it just, everything, like, transmitted to my brain and I recognized everything that was being said without having to read along. And I, and it blew my mind. Like, I caught myself understanding German and but I couldn't have repeated it back but it isn't required and so it wasn't for our kids so my wife and I are none of our kids are fluent in anything 
Um, and it's still so stupid because in America, there is no uh, technically, there's no official language. Like legally, there's no official language. People pretend that English is the official language, but that's false. Like they made the decision during the constitutional convention to write it in English. It was like one vote. They were either going to write it in German or write it in English. And they, mm. English won by like one vote. And so that's, there it is. But, but so we don't do it. And it's just absurd because, you know, we live in between two countries where they speak other languages. So you would assume like if you lived in the Southern border, Spanish would just be required. And if you lived along the Northern border, French would just be required. And if you live in the middle, you should pick one or just, but no, it's not required at all. Some people just go through, they take one semester of like Spanish one and can count to 10. And it's just absurd. Uh, it's, it, it's such a frustrating decision. Like our educational system is so broken in so many ways. Uh, we don't do things that are practical. And then we, we cut things that are like, it's just, our school year is really short. How long is your school year? Ours is 180 days. It's nearer 200. It's, it's, from, four, it's 49 weeks. No, no not 49 it's, weeks. It's, it's from 35 weeks. It's from September until... The end of July. I'm pretty but sure we've got a lot more gaps in it than you have. I'm pretty sure there's it's three. Well, there's three full. There's three full terms. In each term, there's a, a week gap, and at the end of each term, there's a two week gap. So it's basically three weeks per term off, which is about nine plus the six weeks holidays in the middle. 195 so, days. There you go. Now, we're at 180, and that's so about two 180. weeks. Well, 180. Yeah. So that's it's absurd. And if you think about it from that perspective too, well, you're saying it's really three weeks because, you know, five, only five day, we only go to school yeah. five days mm. a week here. And so they built in snow days, like, and weather days. So like in the South, there's hurricanes, there's all kinds of things that could happen that could screw up the school year. Um, and in the North where I'm from, originally up in Michigan, you'd have snow days built in. So even though you're only scheduled 180 days, you're allowed to have five or six snow days. So in theory, you mm. could Get away with having entire school we years. We set days. Uh, we yeah. even set days and bank yeah, but holidays. That's, that's not included in the, the oh, days. Oh, okay. These are days that were like days scheduled excluded. days of class. And then oh, right. a lot of times you'll consider a half a day a full day. So at the end of terms, you'll have like a bullshit day where everybody just shows up. Yeah, we have that. <laughs> and yeah. And those days count as full days. And so it's just we're so woefully behind here. And it's, it's really well, How just, long are your school days? Um, so... It depends on the school, but it's it's pretty standard. They're about seven, seven to eight hours. I, eight I think ours are six. Yeah, ours are no, eight thirty to eight thirty to three is my school. Uh, I think mom was like, yeah, it's eight thirty to three, eight thirty to three thirty ish. Yeah, so, it's like so I guess well. I guess it is seven. I guess it's seven hours, and but then you have to consider there's lunch and you know and moving around time in there. Yeah. So mm. um, I yeah, think with ours, one of the big differences is that yours, you guys is primarily you have a bit of break obviously for christmas and i think thanksgiving but then you've got the giant gap in the middle your six yeah. holidays is like huge whereas we've got as your summer holidays rather is huge whereas we've got obviously the the weeks throughout yeah, the year for us it's it's most high schools most like public schools end up being they they go from like they end around june beginning of june end of may beginning of june so you have oh, wow. all of june all of July and most of August. Now, when I was growing up, we had all of June, all of July, and all of August off. So we had these two made up holidays. One's called Memorial Day and one's called Labor Day. And they're just, they're not, they don't mean anything. Memorial Day is at the end of May and it is there to like kind of honor those who've gone. And it was originally designed as, as like a military holiday. And now it's just kind of become an extra Monday off where people get drunk and go to the park. Um, that's what <laughs> it, that. that's what With it May has. Day bank holiday. No, that's May Day bank holiday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then at the end of, end of the summer, at the beginning of September, there's this thing called Labor Day, which is you're supposed to celebrate, you know, kind of work. And so yeah, when I was wear white after Labor Day, that's the thing, isn't that's it? That's the thing. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, there's an amazing, there's a John Waters film called Serial Mom where, um, oh, she's from Romancing the Stone. What's her name? Catherine. Kathleen Turner plays a serial killer mom. And at the end of the movie, she beats somebody to death with the shoe for wearing white after Labor Day. It's, <laughs> it's absurd. It's serial mom. It's, uh, I can't even express to you how funny that thing is. Anyway, so yeah, so you have these. So when I was growing up, that was it. You didn't go to school for all of June, all of July, and all of August. You had those three months completely off, 12 straight weeks off. And then we would have Thanksgiving would usually you just would get a few days off. And then Christmas break. Um, was usually just two or three weeks. And now it's kind of Christmas breaks a little bit longer. 
but still most most public schools like for kids they're done maybe the first or second week of june and they they're starting to go back yeah we break up i think mid to end it's july. like around the 24th of july that we normally break up for summer go back like first to, what, go like back third the third of september yeah so see, and that makes way more sense. So there's a few places here in Florida that do year round school. So it's, it's more like that where um, they'll get like what you were describing, Mike, where, but it's still the same number of days, unfortunately. Hmm. So year round school isn't like where we upped it to like 200 days, it's still 180 days, just more spread out, which is good because it keeps the retention that kids can remember more. I mean, I'm assuming you find that even in those six weeks when the kids come back in September, they, you you probably have to spend the first month remediating. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And it, that's that what that's what scares me the most about now as well. You're gonna have to teach because, a whole other year in like yeah. They've month. they've essentially how since since the 23rd of March, which is when we went into lockdown. Since 23rd of March, pretty much everything that I've taught them since then is completely invalid. Like realistically, they're not going to remember that information because they're not going to keep going over it. It's just going to go in one ear and out the other. So. And you're not going yeah. back at all? Like you're not going to go back? And- so for me, we don't we don't know when the schools are going back yet. So as it stands, I'm still setting work every day and getting kids to do the work, hopefully. But um, with regards to actually going back into school, we don't know when that's going to happen. A lot of people don't think it's going to be until September. Well, most of the schools here were like our daughter, our oldest daughter is a special ed teacher for elementary school kids. Yeah. And so, yeah, they, they're done for the year. They're just shut down. And she's, it's the same thing where nothing is being required. And so it's kind of leaning on the parents, uh, the parents of her students or special ed students um, who want the lessons. She's been working on lessons and sending stuff out trying to help. Cause you know, again, it's the same thing. She's already got kids who are one to two years grade levels behind, yeah. you know, cause she's teaching them math and reading and stuff that is, you know, trying to get them to grade level. And now they're missing all this time, but they're all, everyone is getting promoted. There's going to be 100% social promotion, even if academically you're not ready to promote. So they are for sure canceled. But with you guys going as late as you do, there is still an outside chance you could get back. Yeah. So yeah, it's either a case that it's going to be, we don't go back until September or we'll go back for like all of two weeks in July. (laughs) But you'd rather that. I personally would rather go back for two weeks in July than not go back at all because that way the kids kind of get reminded of the fact of what school is like and also every time I have a six weeks holiday I always have so much anxiety when I go back to work I like don't sleep well the night before I (laughs) I get really really stressed out so if I don't even get to experience being back in a normal teaching environment and then it's been like what how many months? It would be well, from March to April, September, May, June, six, July, August. It's yeah, it'd be six months. months. If I if I'd gone six months without going back into a classroom, I'd be absolutely Whereas shitting normally myself. It's, really, what, a month and a half, maybe two months. Well, it would be six weeks max. Yeah. yeah so six six months is there is there any consideration there of your? Now I don't know how it works for you guys. If it's coming from Boris down, or if it's like each school board gets to decide. But is there any consideration of just keeping them in through August, like keeping them in? For four weeks and giving them two weeks off before you come back, like coming back, if you don't come back till mid-July, have, going for a month? I have no idea. There's that not a, been any talk of it to our knowledge. No, wow, not to, just, I haven't heard anything about it. How does it work? Not, they're not looking that far ahead, though. They're, they're try, it's it's literally tell, week by week at the moment. I don't yeah. think they're going that far ahead Except regarding... Literally last week they said the lockdown's going to continue for at least three more weeks. That is the right. largest announcement we've had at all. Apart from that, it's literally just been week by week. But I, I suspect it's going to be three months from the end of March to be full lockdown so i think it's going to be start of of july before yeah end of june start of july before they even begin to ease up then i think the whole of july is going to be drop by drop slowly and august they're going to probably if i had to guess let the floodgates loose probably too early and then everyone's going to flood to all the beaches and all like that and then the second wave is going to hit everyone's going to get ill again (laughs) like we're doing in my dumb state with my dumb fuck governor who yeah i heard about that yeah florida's Uh, going back after is how long has it been is it just a month or so not even a month. That's ridiculous. He, he's, a, he's a douche. He actually, the governor of Florida, uh, he is called Ron DeSantis, and he is super unqualified for his job. And he, um, and this is not a joke, when he ran for his position, he had his children, young children, <laughs> in his commercials. Because here, 
politicians do commercial. They are running for office for like a year and a half before the election day. It's obscene uh, the amount of money that people will spend a billion dollars to not win an election. That's pretty common. And so he had a commercial where he was like reading Trump things to his baby. And then he and his daughter were building the wall, the Trump build the wall bullshit out of Legos. And that, and that's not, none of that is fake. That is all real. Like if you were to just get on YouTube and type in DeSantis daughter build the wall, you'd see the video. That is mental. It's obscene. So he won essentially in 2018 saying, I'll be just like Trump. And sure enough, he is, he's illiterate. He um, is super hyper-partisan. He He's on his cabinet. There's one elected Democrat who's the head of agriculture. And Florida is a huge agriculture state. Like literally the farmers in Florida feed the Eastern seaboard. So like when you were in New York, the vegetables you're eating in your salads came from stuff in Florida. I mean, literally like tons of food out of Florida every day, not just citrus. Like you think of, we do tons of food here. So it's kind of going to waste. And so the agriculture secretary, Nikki Freed, she's trying to figure stuff out. And in the open up Florida task force, she wasn't on it. She's the only member of his cabinet not on it because she's a Democrat and he's a Republican. Mm. And it's, he's just, he's a giant moron and it's super embarrassing. And um, yeah, they opened up beaches and, and, you know, people in my building seem to think it's, they believe in the sunlight's going to kill the virus bullshit. And it's, um, <laughs> it's so frustrating. Like I've, I'm super frustrated with everybody and it's, it's, it's out of control. And, and so I know, Mike, I'm sorry, you didn't want to talk about this. It's kind of no, hard I'm, not I'm happy. to. No, yeah. no, of course not. I'm happy to talk about it. I just meant more so to begin with, didn't yeah. want to delve straight. If, it, if the conversation yeah. goes to it, it's fine. Yeah. It, has, it is a big thing about all of us, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's something that's obviously affecting all of us. It's Nothing like this has happened. Uh, it, except us. when you were saying about uh, in the Spanish flu in the early 1900s, 1910s yeah, it's or almost, something. It was in 1918. Yeah, and it was a... And it's interesting, again, how, you know, racism plays into that. So the Spanish flu was called the Spanish flu because it was the, it only country, in Spain. It was the only country that reported on it. At the time, no one was reporting on it. And when they started reporting on it, then they got named the Spanish flu. Of course, it didn't fucking start there. And then, <laughs> so there's, there's a restaurant up the road from us that we love. It's a Chinese restaurant. We love it. Love it. Love it. I'm a vegetarian. They make great food there. They have this. It's, I love it there. <laughs> and I can't express to you how happy, how much, and they're shut down right now during the coronavirus. The Mexican place up the road, which we like, they're doing takeout food. And if it had been called the Mexican flu, they would for sure be closed and the Chinese restaurant would be closed, would be open simply because our idiot president. And then it was mimicked by our idiot governor saying, calling it the Chinese flu. And that's like, dude, shut up, shut your mouth. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's super frustrating. And, uh, and it's weird too, because like we started off, I mean, this is my life. I normally am just in my house all day. I work from home all the time, but it's still the world out there is happening and it, it, it can't help but seep in. Like we do our best to block it out. But when you, you know, log in and you open the, whatever your news feed is that you read and that's all it is, there's no other news. Hmm. You know, the best thing to do is, you know, read as many books as possible and hopefully talk to people. So I'm sorry we went down this road. <laughs> I really do apologize. No, you don't need to apologize for the the thing. It it's yeah. it is mental. It it's just not like anything else that any of us have, have been through. And that's the end of part one. Thanks as always for listening, guys. Part two will be out next week at the same time, so be sure to look out for that. For a little bit of information, in part two, obviously the chat does continue generally about sort of education and that sort of thing, but we also speak about passing down interests to children, uh, how myself and Megan and Tony and his partner have been handling the lockdown as a couple. Uh, we also speak about Star Wars for a little bit. We speak about back in the day in air quotes, you know, before streaming services that we used to have CDs and mixtapes and all that sort of stuff. And then we talk about Megan's lockdown birthday and a few other things. So, you know, it's, it's quite a nice wide uh, different conversation part two. Part two is a lot more very different subjects kind of dotting from here to there and everywhere. Whereas part one, Although it did flit a fair amount, it kind of stuck to certain subjects a bit more. Coming out the weeks after that, I do have a podcast due for being recording on this coming Tuesday. It's going to be about wrestling. It's with Chris of the Comics and Motion podcast and Scott Weatherly of the 20th Century Geek podcast. They're both really into wrestling. I've never really been that into wrestling. I played the WWE Smackdown vs. Raw games a bit when I was younger, and I've seen the odd bit about wrestling, but they're really, really into it. 
they had this little fake Twitter feud on online and things. It was really interesting. We're going to get into as well. So I want to have them on for that. The week after that, I think I've got Dave from Comics in Motion and then Max Byrne of the Mandatory Marvel and DC podcast. Uh, both of those are on the Comics in Motion feed. And yeah, I'm going to talk to them about comics, really. I think we're going to talk about sort of DC comic book movies and things like that a fair amount. I haven't really got any specific subject matter for that. I've just got a couple of bullet points. So that's what you can kind of look forward to going forward. Um, As I've said in previous outros for other episodes, what I really want to do is just have a lot of episodes coming out during this pandemic or during the lockdown, whatever you want to call it, which are episodes a bit more, a bit more fun, a bit more just not focusing too heavily on the lockdown stuff just more so having a laugh i know this chat did have a fair amount of lockdown stuff within it but it was sort of had to go hand in hand so we could talk about education and the impact on that but i am trying to kind of get some more podcasts that aren't about serious things that aren't as strict and are just fun chilled out things that people i can rely on so that's kind of what you can expect um i will say if people aren't aware because i go on about it so goddamn much now on social media and everything else i have another podcast called star wars comics in canon it airs on the Comics in Motion podcast feed. It's on Saturdays. I really recommend people go check it out. Obviously, it's my own podcast, so a lot of fun there. But it's just me talking to the microphone, to you guys. Uh, It's just about Star Wars comics. Each episode is normally between 15 and 20 minutes long or so. There's the odd double feature episode, which uh, there's one that's already out and there's one that's due to be recorded soon. They're more close to half an hour, but they're still quite short. I talk about one individual comic, but then I add a little bit of flavor text to it and stuff like that as well. In fact, the most recent episode I released was Star Wars Allegiance, uh, which is basically a comic set between episodes 8 and 9, so it kind of tells you a bit of what the Resistance and stuff got up to in the years spanning between The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker. There's no spoilers for The Rise of Skywalker within that, it is just lightly jumping off the plot from The Last Jedi, and I also speak about Mon Cala and the species within that, which is the Mon Calamari, which is what Admiral Akbar is, which is the guy who says, it's a trap, if you're not aware, and also the Quarren, both of them live on the same planet, it's like a water world, and I also speak about Admiral Akbar's son. So, just a good way for you to, if you want to get into the wider Star Wars canon, because we're not going to have any more Star Wars movies until I think the end of 2021, maybe 2022, I can't fully remember, but where we've got these series on Disney+, Plus, Clone Wars, Rebels, resistance and the mandalorian we got more coming up but a lot of the stories are told in the books and also in the comics so what i'm trying to do is create a vague guide for people so if you want to read the comics you can still listen to the podcast and read the comics and still get something out of it as little easter eggs you may have missed or bits of trivia about characters in there you may not know or if you have no interest in reading the comics but you want to know about the wider star wars canon it's a good way to expand your knowledge on star wars and when i talk about things in that i also speak about other comics made by the same authors or or books that I feel like relate to them quite nicely. There's quite a lot of content around Princess Leia, so I speak about some of the books that have come out to do with that. I think they're all written by Claudia Gray, to be honest. I think it's Leia, Princess of Alderaan, and Bloodline. But anyway, it's a good companion, essentially. So yeah, go check out Star Wars Comics and Canon. I know quite a few of you guys have been checking it out, and I do really, really appreciate that. And as I always say on this show, I don't pay for promotion. I just rely on word of mouth. I collaborate with people and I swap promos. That's how I get my show out. If you listen to either Star Wars Comics and Canon, Genuine Chit Chat, or you listen to any of the other guys I associate with, you know, the guys from Comics and Motion, Tony uh, or Max, both from, you know, Indie Comics Spotlight and Mandatory Marvel and DC, Scott Weatherly from 20th Century Geek. Anyone I have on the show or anyone that I do promos for or anything like that are people that I would love you guys to check out and send good wishes to. So, That's basically all I'm going to say in this, Mark. I really hope you guys are staying safe. I really hope that in this lockdown and stuff, you guys are either finding ways to help your time, you know, use your time wisely in a sense of doing cool things that you've been meaning to do, like write a book or, you know, do some chores around the house that you've been meaning to do for ages that you just haven't got done yet, because that's what me and Megan are doing, or just having the time to breathe and to collect yourself and get ready for when the lockdown is over, because we're all going to be thrown back into work and stuff. So, just want to send my best wishes to you guys out there. Obviously, contact me on social media, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Genuine Chit Chat. Email me at genuinechitchat at outlook.com. If you have a Star Wars query, you can send it to Genuine Chit Chat out at you can send it to genuine chit chat at outlook.com if you want, or you can send it to the Star Wars Comics in Canon at Outlook email. Both go to the same inbox, both come to me. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, I'll respond to them the same. But that's basically it for me, guys. As I say, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I hope you all stay safe. May the force be with you, and every other goodbye that I can say relating to this chat. Talk to you guys later.